My name is Rich Chester, and I'm the Director of Business Intelligence at LPA Software Solutions. It's my pleasure to be with you today to talk about installing and migrating to the Cognos Analytics release version 11.0.3. Throughout the webinar, as questions occur to you, please enter them through the chat feature in the WebEx. At the end of the webinar, uh, time permitting, I'll answer as many of those questions as I can. Any questions that I don't get to during the webinar while we're on the air, I will answer via email directly after the webinar. So I look forward to your questions, so please submit them as we go. Our agenda today is to talk a bit about the Cognos Analytics installation options, um, both on Windows and on Unix, but I will do a quick demonstration of uh, the Windows installation uh, uh, as part of today's webinar. Then we'll discuss um, a little bit about upgrading and converting uh, from Cognos 8 and 10 to Cognos 11, specifically what happens with those uh, reports and components that are considered quote unquote legacy. Then we'll move into a discussion and some demonstrations of the new 1103 features um, that enhanced uh, both the, the reporting, the data modules, and the dashboards components of Cognos Analytics. And then, as I said earlier, that'll be followed by questions and answers as time permits, with the remaining questions being addressed by email afterwards. Now, this is not a comprehensive um, review of all of the features and functions of uh, Cognos Analytics, nor is it a deep dive into data modules or dashboards, two of the very exciting new features. Those are webinars we've actually already done and perhaps many of you attended. For those of you who didn't attend but are interested, all of our webinars are recorded and we post free of charge on our website, lpa.com slash resources. So you have a searchable list there of 54 or so webinars, uh, as well as some additional uh, resources that you might find useful in business intelligence, of course, but also information management, predictive analytics, financial performance management, and many others. Um, they're free of charge. There's no registration required. Uh, if you prefer, um, almost all of our webinars are also available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so, you know, for a deep dive into data modules or dashboards or uh, a look at Cognos Analytics uh, as a, a new interface and uh, a walk through all of the different uh, components of the interface, those webinars are out there for you to take advantage of. Today, we're going to talk a bit about the installation and a little bit about the upgrading. Um, and then we're going to spend uh, a time on the enhancements in 1103. From an installation perspective, the installation of 1103 has changed a bit from the 1102 and before installation options, but they're still fundamentally the same. Um, you have two options in Windows. You only have one option in uh, Unix Linux. Um, the two options in Windows are called the Easy Install and the Custom Install. Um, Unix and Linux, you have access to the custom install only. Um, for Windows users, the easy install um, installs, of course, Cognos Analytics, but it also installs Informix for your content store and LDAP for you to manage and create users in. It configures your Cognos Analytics installation to use the Informix content store and the LDAP, starts it up, tells you the URL, and you can immediately get underway. Custom lets you pick the components that you want um, to install. A, uh, a custom installation or an easy install installation can both be expanded to multi-server. It's not so much about the multi-serverness of a particular uh, installation. It's really about um, you know, the automation that goes on under an easy install. There's an automatic install of a database, an automatic install of an LDAP, some automatic configuration, um, and the content management and the application tiers are installed, uh, and the gateway tier is not. On the custom install, the very first install requires a uh, content management tier to be installed, but you can choose to install application or not, and you can choose to install the optional gateway or not. Um, subsequent installs of either uh, require that the first install that you did is up and running, and it uses that first install to help uh, begin the configuration of the subsequent installs. Um, and the, uh, uh, the first time you install with either of them, the content management tier is required. There's no optionality. There's no way to uncheck that install. When you install with the easy install, 
the legacy components, and those are Analysis Studio, Query Studio, Cognos Workspace, um, Event Studio, Package-Based Drill-Throughs. I think that's all of them. Those are disabled by default with the easy install option. With the custom install option, those tools are enabled by default. Now, people are confused about what disabled and enabled means, so I'm going to show you what that means um, in, uh, in my uh, example here. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, my server where I have begun the installation. Now, this server already has an installation on it. I'm not going to actually go all the way through the installation. We don't have time for that. But I want to talk you through a couple of those options um, and, um, and give you a feel for the installation process. So the first thing it's going to ask me to do is it's going to ask me to pick a language. Uh, that language is both the, uh, well, first it's going to ask me to agree to a, a license agreement. Um, and if you're like me, you don't read those. Always install Cognos, um, just like in Cognos, to 8 and 10 days on a different spindle if you have the uh, luxury of two disk drives on your Cognos server. Um, I'm going to leave it on the C drive because actually I've already got uh, a Cognos installed on the E drive uh, on the server, but um, usually you would set this to a different drive. Also, do be sure to check the make all shortcuts, uh, make the shortcut available to all users. Um, so that anyone that logs on to the server would have access to the Cognos shortcuts. I think that's a good idea. So this is where I pick my easy install or my custom install. Now, if I pick my easy install, it's just gonna it's just gonna um, start asking me questions about like what's the administrator user because it's installing an, LD an LDAP and it needs to have an, an admin user defined. So it's gonna ask me for an admin user uh, uh, password. Um, it's going to um, install that Informix database form. It's going to do all of those things automatically. And in fact, on this server, that's exactly what I did, is I did uh, the easy install. Um, I'm going to ch choose custom here just to show you what happens when you do custom. Now, custom does not install a database, which means you have to have one of the supported content store databases available to you. Custom does not install an LDAP. So in this case, you would probably configure to use um, like maybe your Active Directory at your company, right? Um, so if you don't need those extra things like the Informix and the LDAP, then choose Custom. But remember that Custom uh, uh, um, does enable those uh, uh, legacy components, whereas the Easy Install does not. Although I'll show you how you can uh, enable them. I'll go ahead and click Next on the Custom. Um, first install requires that you install the Content Manager. Um, second installs are really referred to as connected install. It needs that first install up and running. It'll actually ask you for the address of that first install um, as part of installing any subsequent servers. So if you've got multiple servers in your environment uh, where you're doing load balancing across them, you'll do a first install. It'll be up and running. All subsequent installs will um, request <clears throat> that you uh, connect to that first install as part of it. Um, I'll do a first install here. You see, I cannot override that the content tier will be installed um, on this first install, but I can choose um, either of these other guys to install. Uh, the optional gateway um, is truly optional. Um, you'll find on this server, I don't have the gateway installed. Um, uh, and you don't need the gateway installed to run the product per se. Um, the application tier, of course, is what actually runs my reports and presents my results and stuff. So you need at least one of those. Um, I'm not going to continue the installation at this point. Um, you get, I hope, the flavor for the options you have um, when you run the installation. Once it's installed, it looks just like Cognos 10. From the point of view of on the server, there is a Cognos configuration. That Cognos configuration looks almost identical to the Cognos configuration that you're used to. Um, in this case, my content store is that Informix database. Remember, this was one of those easy installs on this server. So it set me up here. It did all this configuration itself. I did not edit this configuration. Um, this Cognos user's namespace, that's the LDAP that was installed. Um, and configured for me out in the environment. It's configured all of my entries for me, right? So I can come in here, I can override, I can I can update, I can change, but this was all done for me and um, the uh, URL was presented in one of the last uh, panels of the installation because I chose that easy install. Now, 
one of the things I want to talk to you about is what happens to uploaded, upgraded, excuse me, upgraded content. So here I've logged on to my um, environment. Now you see my URL, server colon 9300 slash BI. That's going to be the default URL. Um, it is, uh, for some folks, it is not um, acceptable to have the port number in the URL. For other folks, they don't have a problem with it. If you don't want the port number in the URL, you can install a gateway, configure a web server, and you can mask this URL. Um, but uh, I've gone with the vanilla install here um, for my demonstration purposes. Now, when I say that the, uh, the tools are enabled or disabled, um, what I'm talking about is the entry other that would be here if they're enabled. Uh, notice there's no other here. So that means in this installation, the legacy tools are disabled. If I log on to a, another server of mine, um, I'll show you what it looks like when they are enabled. So this will just take a moment. Um, now, if you have installed and you, uh, um, you wish that you had done the other setting for legacy, right? It's on and you want it off. Um, it's off and you want it on. You can just change a simple configuration file. There's one line in the file. Um, it'll say it's a legacy line. It'll either equal to zero when they're off or equals one when they're on. Toggle it to zero or one based on what you want. Restart that Cognos installation, and then you'll uh, you'll be able to enable or disable the legacy. So on this guy, all I want to show you is this one has legacy enabled. You see this other entry is here on the uh, server I installed with the uh, ready to run that uh, that easy install option. Um, no legacy other here. Um, again, sorry. What is legacy? Um, it is. Analysis Studio, Drill Through Definitions, Event Studio, Query Studio, and Workspace. What does it mean to have legacy installed? It means that I can create new ones. It doesn't mean I cannot run my old ones. So let me go back to my, so this is my uh, uh, easy install, legacy, not enabled. However, I have converted a whole bunch of 10.2.2 content. So here's an Analysis Studio report that I converted. Here's a Query Studio report that I converted. Here's Cognos Workspace and so on. If I were to run the Analysis Studio report, you'll see that it pops up and it runs in full-on, full-blown Analysis Studio. So you see all of my, my 10 and, and 8 content when I upgrade it is available to me, whether the legacy tools are enabled or not. Um, it's not about whether I can use what I've upgraded. It's about whether I can create new ones in those legacy tools. So let me shut down my Analysis Studio one. Uh, I'll open my Query Studio report, and you'll see that it looks just like Query Studio in 10.2.2. Um, if I open up a Cognos workspace, uh, it will open up. Now you see they're not opening up in the new Cognos Analytics interface. They're not opening up here like converted reports will, um, but they still run. Uh, Cognos Workspace um, runs just like it did. You know, I can continue to edit my, uh, uh, my workspace and add new content to it and so on. So the legacy tools being enabled is about creation of new entries. All of the converted entries will still work and run, uh, even if you have not enabled the legacy tools in your environment. So I wanted to make sure that I pointed that out and I made that clear with this demonstration um, as part of today. But there are so many interesting things to talk about in terms of new features. I want to jump right in to new features. So let's go ahead and talk about the new features in the reporting world. So three big deals in the reporting world um, that are each worthy of you know, a few minutes uh, of talking about, and then I'll do some quick demonstrations on. The first is I can create reports uh, um, with multiple packages in the same report. Uh, so that's something that I think a lot of us have been waiting for for a very long time. It is finally here with this 1103 release. Uh, there is a new active report uh, uh, object called the data list that uh, gives me some uh, features and functions with uh, large lists in terms of filtering those, um, that's new. And then something called filtered text, which is something that we had in 
Query Studio, um, and we now have available to us in the reporting environment, which is automatic labeling of our reports with the filters that are uh, part of the uh, uh, queries in my report. So quickly on each of those three. Multi-package reporting. Probably the biggest thing to take away from this busy slide is the packages must be dynamic query mode packages. Um, if you add a DQM package as your first package, you'll be able to click the plus button. You'll see in a second what I mean by the plus button um, and add more packages to your report. Um, if you add a CQM package, works perfectly fine. That I'm not trying to imply there's anything deficient uh, in the reporting world when you use CQM, except this new feature won't work because it only works with dynamic query mode packages. So your compatible query mode packages, um, you're still limited to one package per report. Now, the first package you add to your report is called the default package. The important thing about the default package is Cognos uses the routing rules for that package to control the routing for the report. It uses any capability settings and the properties of that package um, to control the capabilities available for your report. And once you set the default package, uh, you can't delete it. Turns out you can replace it. You can right click on it and say, I want to substitute another, but you can't actually remove it. Subsequent packages you add to the report, you could actually remove, um, uh, but not the first package, not the default package. Um, if you delete a, a, a package, it will delete all the queries associated with that package. Um, you can't cross the streams in a single data object. In other words, I can't take data item from package one and data item from package two and drop them in the same list, the same cross tab, the same chart. Uh, queries now have a property called uh, what package is associated with this query. So the first data item I add to a query sets the package that is associated with the query, can't add data items from another package to that query, okay? So cross package joins not supported, and, and that's what I'm talking about here, is I cannot put two, um, two uh, uh, columns, uh, one from package A, one from package B in the same query. It doesn't work across packages, okay? Another feature is this new data list. Now, in an active report, um, we've always had to work with our lists, um, uh, especially very large lists, to uh, try to make them appear to be filtered. Um, um, because if I filter large, large lists, um, it runs very slowly in an active report. So I would normally place a list inside a data deck. I would do master detail relationships. I would do uh, a number of operations to make the list appear to be being filtered. Um, but run fast enough so that my users were satisfied with the active report performance. Um, also, in uh, um, pr prior to this release, uh, I couldn't freeze list headings. So if I made my list scrollable, as I scrolled, my list headers scrolled off, and I couldn't see them at the top of my list anymore. The data list object in active reports um, solves both of those problems. First of all, it renders the list and filters the list locally when the um, report runs. So it's going to run uh, in memory on your uh, browser or on your uh, uh, mobile device. Um, and as a result of that, it's going to actually filter very, very quickly. It's going to present quickly. It's going to filter quickly. So that takes care of the filtery part, number one. Number two, um, it automatically scrolls with the headers um, pinned. So you can scroll up and down uh, and you still have the headers over your columns. So I'll show you a quick uh, demo of a report with a data list in it. And then finally, this automatic filter text. So um, we want to add a dynamic control to our reports that um, show the filters that are in place for the objects on the page. Um, so, uh, and as I add new filters, I don't want to have to update this text, uh, which, you know, in uh, up before this release, right, I would have to create my own text items to set the context on the report page for filters, especially invisible filters, filters that weren't obvious from the data being displayed, uh, you know, filtering on a year but not showing any dates in my report. It's not obvious what, that, what how that report's filtered. So it was up to me as the author to set the context by putting in text items um, or maybe report expressions when the filter was uh, uh, values were based on a prompt. Um, now we have this new control. Um, that you get at by clicking on the edit button 
on an object and you choose this insert filter text option and it puts this dynamic control above the object um, this this control can be moved around um, I'm not sure what limitations there might be on it um, but it's a control and it's associated with a query so you know if I've got five objects all using uh, one query they're all filtered the same so I don't need the filter text five times uh, I only need to filter text once maybe I want to put it up uh, in the header of my report or something along those lines um, but as you see in the in the bottom here it shows you the contents of the filter now reports in Cognos 11 can run in either full interactive mode or non-interactive mode when you upgrade reports um, either Query Studio, excuse me, either Cognos Workspace Advanced Reports or Report Studio Reports. They automatically come up in non-interactive mode. And what that means is, whoops, when you run them, you, um, you'll, they'll run just like they did in um, 10.2.2. The user experience is exactly the same. Um, this is in contrast to what is known as full interactive mode, which is new in Cognos 11. And if you haven't seen it, I'll quickly edit this report and change the one property needed to update uh, the report to um, full interactive mode. It's right here, run with full interactivity. I'll set it to yes, um, save my report. I will close both versions and rerun my report from scratch now um, it will present the exact same data but what you'll see is when I click on it I get um, toolbars uh, I, this is essentially a uh, a very rudimentary report editing environment now so not only am I consuming the data I'm looking at the data I'm seeing the data right but I also can uh, sort and filter I can um, add calculations. Um, each object gets a different set of buttons in interactive mode. Again, my goal here isn't to fully explain interactive mode, but it's to highlight that there are two modes that reports run in. All converted reports will come up with that property set to no. And then you can, if you choose to, on each report that you've converted, you could set that property to yes if you want to enable this interactivity for that report. It's set report by report. All new reports you create in 11, that's automatically set to yes. Converted reports, when you upgrade from um, 8 or 10 up to 11, those converted reports will come up with that set to no. So you just have to turn it on for those ones that you want. And then for new reports, you have to turn it off for those that you don't want this interactivity. But this editing mode um, is what I'm talking about for this one um, item here, which is any user-defined filters are added when the report is run in full interactivity mode. So I create the report, I drop three or four filters into my query, the text is shown for the query, uh, the filters that I added, a user is running in interactive mode, they get a toolbar, they click on the filter button, they add another filter, that text automatically updates uh, with their new filter too. So let's go ahead and do a demo of uh, these features. So here, let me close this report. First thing is going to be um, this uh, multi-package report uh, um, discussion. So let me go ahead uh, and edit a report that I have um, that is not yet multi-package, but is about to be. So I just quickly wrote a report earlier with one package in it. It's a dynamic query mode package. Uh, it shows a, a chart. I'll go ahead and turn on page preview mode, um, and you can see this chart is coming from Go Sales Query. Uh, notice that this plus button is active. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and click on the plus button, and I'm going to add another package, and it's going to be my Go Data Warehouse Query package. So you'll see that it adds the other package. Now the query associated with this guy, it's called Query 1. If I switch and I navigate to my queries and I choose query one you'll notice that query one see it's got that it's from go sales query now if I go back to my report page and I add a new chart over here and let's just do another bar chart 
and I start to drop into it from my other package. So I'll go ahead and drop in some sales data. And here I'll do it by uh, order method type. And I'm going to do uh, gross, uh, gross profit as my measure. And I'll break that down by year. Now, what I might try to do, right, is pull year from the other package by mistake. Now, if I do try to do that, right, because this query that's behind this is now associated with GoData Warehouse. If I do try to mix and match, it will not let me. It will give me an error. So you'll see if I do that. So you can only uh, uh, insert from the same package. So it doesn't let me mix within a single query data from two different packages. Of course, since the other package contains uh, the time entry, I can finish my, uh, my work here and drop year in as my uh, category and get the one I desire. So here's a report written from two packages, uh, which is not something we've been able to do heretofore. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the two packages, uh, multi, multiple packages, not limited to two, multiple packages per report. Remember, this is my default package. Any capabilities, uh, any routing rules associated with that package apply to the entire report. Uh, also, if I try to delete the primary package, the uh, default package, it tells me I can't. Uh, however, I could delete this package. When I delete this package, it's going to remove all of the queries associated with it. Um, and therefore, it's going to remove my uh, other chart, right? Because when you delete the query, um, it, it cleans up after itself, just like Report Studio always did, right? And it removed the object associated with that query as well. So that, in a nutshell, is multi-package reports. Again, dynamic query mode only. Next one we'll look at is this data list. So again, I have a quick report that I already worked on uh, for the data list. I'll just walk you through it, and then we'll take a look at how it works. So remember, uh, data list is for active reports only. So here's an active report. In this active report, I have two data drop-down lists, one filtering by order method and one filtering by retail type, actually just listing. What I want is this list to be filtered by these two items. Notice they're not visible in my list, right? This doesn't show order method or retailer type, but I would like it filtered by those two attributes. I also don't want this list to have the headers scroll off. I want the headers pinned. Um, so, and it's a long list because you see it's by product. So, you know, there's many thousands of rows in this list and I want it filtered by these two and I want it fast. So that's what this data um, object is all about. So this new data list object is for large lists, filtered fast, um, pinned headings. So if you look at the, um, the list, you'll see I've got um, the things that I drop in as non-measures become categories. My measures become values. And then I can add in these extra categories. So this is sort of like the properties property on a list or a cross tab or a chart where I can add columns to an object, but they're not visible. Um, this reminds me very much of how visualizations work um, is, you know, with these extra categories and these extra values. And I don't know that this is a visualization, but it certainly smells like this, this object could be a visualization. But regardless, um, it does exactly what they say. So in an active report, of course, you connect things. Um, you connect uh, and you communicate by variables. Um, if you're not an active report developer, uh, we have a webinar on that, and you can get a full hour that will introduce you to this notion of active report development. Um, for those of you who are active report uh, savvy, um, you'll note that on this uh, data list, I have created a filter. So this is filtering for retailer types and order methods that match my to drop downs um, on a large list that's an unusual approach um, because of the, uh, the problem with speed of the filtering. It's not a great user experience, but this data list actually filters the data locally. So um, it'll actually run pretty speedy and I get that added benefit of not having my, uh, my headings scroll off the top. 
So um, notice that uh, the scrollable height is set to 400. That's settable. That happens to be the uh, default is 400. And the row height is default is 30. So those are actually the default settings. I didn't change those. Let's go ahead and run this active report and see how it works. So very, um, uh, very large list displayed very, very quickly. See, it's scrollable automatically. I didn't have to put it in a block. Um, I didn't have to do anything special to create these column headers. Um, again, with a regular list, I have to work very, very hard just to get this scrolling action uh, that I have without uh, the headers uh, rolling off. Um, and you'll see, uh, as I change my values here, it filters very, very quickly. OK, so that's what a data list is for. Long lists, filtered quickly, pinned headings. That all works. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I'd, I'd like to format my revenue and my gross profit. Can I do that? Um, you know, I originally thought you could not um, because I could not find the properties because I was treating it like a list. Uh, so I clicked on the revenue column and I looked for a um, data format uh, um, property or a data format button could not find it, originally assumed that it was not there. Um, turns out that it is there, but you have to click on it over here in um, this part of the dialog. You see you have data format. So I'll go ahead and change these to currency. Now, one thing I've discovered is if I do not set any of the properties, I click OK. It keeps the fact that I picked currency, but it doesn't change the number. It doesn't make any change to the view. Um, unless I set at least one property, which I will do, um, it didn't actually change the format. So again, I thought um, I'd gotten it wrong and that um, I couldn't data format it. It just turned out there were a couple of rules that I had to be uh, aware of. So again, I will put in a property here. And now when I run, uh, you'll see that the data is uh, formatted um, as I specified currency Let's see with zero decimals. All right. So I have um, now a new object for active reports only that um, does uh, what we used to have to spend quite a lot of time uh, managing uh, and avoids the whole um, requirement of using a, a data deck and a master detail relationship on your list to achieve the fast filter effect. Here I'm doing a filter and it's happening uh, locally um, in, the, uh, um, in, in this data list object. So that's data lists. And then the third enhancement had to do with this filter text. So let's take a look at the filter text. So I have, uh, again, a little starter report. It's a simple cross tab. I'll go ahead and edit it and just take a quick walk through it. So on this report, I've got a cross tab. I've got no context set uh, for this report. So no headings, no, no anything. And it turns out that the query for this uh, cross tab is indeed filtered. Uh, but anyone receiving uh, this cross tab uh, in, a, in a PDF would have no notion that it was filtered at all. Um, and if they did have a notion it was filtered, they wouldn't know exactly um, by what. And that's the whole point of being able to express a context for the report. But it used to be I had to express that context by hand. In other words, I would have to go to my toolbox, add a text item, and type in what all of my filters were to be able to set that context. And then as I added in my report, I would have to update those filters. Or um, it could turn out that um, uh, the uh, values in my filters were the result of prompts. And so they would not be static. So I couldn't use a text item. I would have to uh, use a, a layout calculation, for example. So um, a lot of work went into uh, setting the context for filtering on a report. Um, with this release, what I can do is I can click on the filter button for this report, and uh, for this object, I mean, and choose insert filter text. And once I've done that, this filter text object uh, has been added. Um, it's got its own little property sheet. You see it's affiliated with the query of the cross tab. Um, you know, if I move this up to the header, um, it can go in the header. So it's not stuck with the object, right? For now, I'll just leave it with the object. But you can format the page once you've generated it. Um, if you have multiple queries, you could generate multiples of these little objects and put them on the report in an appropriate place. But the important thing is when you run your report, the filters on that query will be expressed. Okay? 
Now this is a report that is running in full interactive mode. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a custom filter on it. And um, oh, I really need to pick the item I'm filtering on first. So I'm going to filter it just to Europe. So I'm going to create a custom filter and add um, a couple more values. Uh, I'll just do I'll just do it that way. The point is, I filtered my through the interactive mode. I filtered my columns, and you see, it added that filter to my list of filters automatically. So it actually, as I use this full interactivity mode to quote unquote edit my report in a basic way, and filtering is one of the things I might do. Um, the filters that I add are actually going to be here. So um, that's a nice uh, feature. Is it's dynamic even in this full interactivity mode. Now the one thing I'll show you that um, uh, is a is a limitation um, is this: when I create a filter by clicking, let's say uh, I want to filter to a particular um, country, I can do a right click filter for report, and that works and the, the text will, will display here correctly. I can also click here and use this filter button and use the filter options here, and that those filters will show up in the filter text. But report authors also know that you could navigate directly to the query and add a filter to the query. Um, for example, if I wanted to filter by country, and I could say, uh, let's make this Canada, and filter to Canada, let's suppose. When I use a filter and they built the filter with the expression editor, like I just did, that's um, this view. This is the expression editor. When I build a filter with the expression editor, um, that text that uh, I want to come out um, cannot express that filter in English. So it expresses that there is a an expression-based filter there, but it doesn't tell me what it is or how many. So if I want to use this tool, um, at least in this release, I cannot use um, expression-based filters. Um, they won't display. I can only use filters that are built using the filter tool, uh, which I can access by right-clicking, or I can access using the filter button on the page. So that's the one limitation that I've found uh, as I've used this so far. Um, one other quick property on this uh, guy is uh, it doesn't have to display all of your detail and summary filters. It can display uh, either or. So um, you don't have to, uh, you can control a little bit which um, filters it's displaying. Also, if you have multiple queries, you can switch this guy to a different query. Um, there's only one query in my list right now, so I can't show you that. So that is filter text. And those are the enhancements um, to uh, the reporting world. So let's quickly go back to our slides and take a look at um, the data modules, new features. Data module, new feature uh, is really um, very straightforward to just talk about. And that is that the picture on the right hand side of the data module is now active. In other words, it used to be a picture of your module. It showed you all the components and the joins between them, but it didn't do anything when you clicked on it. It didn't let you edit things. It didn't let you click on two tables and say, I want to join them. It was inert. It was a picture and only a picture, if you will. Um, what they've done in 11.03 is they have uh, enabled you to actually use the picture to model. So instead of using the tree in the center of the interface and only the tree, you can now do many, many things uh, by using the picture in the data module. Um, the other thing they did with data modules is um, it was counterintuitive in terms of uh, adding a data item to an expression in your data module. Um, uh, you had to double click it. Um, and the natural gesture was to drag it. So they enabled that natural gesture. Uh, in the data module world, they're all about adding uh, natural gestures. Um, and that's really where this whole picture enhancement came from. And this drag and drop is just yet another uh, example of trying to make it a more natural interface uh, for people to use. It was more natural to try to drag those columns in. It was less natural to double click them. So they added the ability to do the drag and drop. So let's take a quick look at a data module 
and what I mean about this active um, interaction. So let me go ahead and, um, oh, let me just create a new data module. So I'll create a data module um, from some uh, um, uploaded files. And I'll go ahead and put some uploaded files in and click Start. And um, I'll go ahead and add those files to my data module. And now you see I have this picture over here. yeah. And up until this release, this picture was just a picture. Um, and it would show me joins, but it wouldn't let me create joins. If I wanted to create a join between two objects, I had to do the clicking and the joining from that interface. However, now I can use the picture and right click and join. Um, you know, I can uh, click on an ob a single object and right click and hit its properties or remove the object or add a filter to the object. So almost everything I could do over here on the more, I can now do from the picture. Uh, so now the picture is, isn't just inert, um, it is interactive and I can leverage it to um, create and edit and modify my data module. So that's the big data module enhancement. And then finally, there are some enhancements in the world of dashboards. Uh, dashboard, um, uh, the ability to add calculations, great ad, super ad. Um, hover over tooltips that uh, uh, just give you more uh, um, uh, uh, ability to, to turn your users loose and not have to do a ton of training. Um, they can just hover over things and get hints on what those things do. Um, if you've written a, a um, dashboard against a data source, let's say a data module, and you need to move it, migrate it uh, to a different data module, you can do that now. You can relink a dashboard to a different source, um, and then they've enhanced the ability to format um, the uh, columns in your dashboard. So um, creating the calculations is as simple as um, uh, selecting the two items you'd like to calculate with, using the more button and choosing calculate. You'll get a dialog that allows you to um, create a simple calculation, um, simple arithmetic plus percentage and percent change. Um, you could also create calculations off of a tabular widget. Uh, in a dashboard, you can create graphical widgets or tabular widgets. In the tabular widget, um, you can, can uh, click on your operands and click on the calculate button and you can create calculations. Once you create a calculation, you can give it a name. It becomes part of the data module. Uh, pardon me. It becomes part of the dashboard, and you can use it in other components in the dashboard. Um, it's private to that dashboard. So if you know if I need that same calculation in five dashboards, I would either create it in all five dashboards, or if the five dashboards were sourced from the same. Uh, data module, I create it in the data module, of course, in that case. But in the case where I need a calculation and it's not in my source, my data module, or my uploaded file, I can create that calculation now uh, in the uh, dashboard tool. This notion of dashboard relinking. So it goes back to, um, I created a dashboard, it's, uh, um, uh, it's using uh, a data module, and I've decided to build a new data module and I want to migrate this dashboard to the new data module. So um, before what I have to do before this release, I'd have to just write the new dashboard and hook it to my new data module. And uh, I couldn't reuse the old one, if you will. Um, with this release, what I can do is I can right click on the data source and I can say uh, relink and pick a new data module. And then it'll, uh, it will find all the matching columns and any non-matching columns that'll let me fix. So here's an example of a widget um, where I, uh, the new data module didn't find the match on year. So it's allowing me to fix the widget. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, what I have found so far is that I can, if I have based my data module on an uploaded file, I can replace it with another uploaded file. And do the relinking. If I based the dashboard on a data module, I can relink it to another data module. Um, I did not find you could um, switch from an uploaded file to a data module or vice versa with this relinking. Um, and then finally, data formatting. So um, before this release, you were limited in your data formatting options really to uh, just abbreviating the numbers. Um, and that was done actually through the property sheet uh, in 1102. 
And 1103, you can still abbreviate, um, but you also get to control a little bit more the data format uh, of your objects. You uh, go into this expanded mode, this called focus view mode. You click on the item you'd like to format. You click on the data format button, and then you've got format options. And so that abbreviate has moved for those of you who are looking for it in your 1103 install uh, from uh, the, the property sheet to um, this uh, data format button that's available in the expanded focus view of your widgets. And so those are your updates for your dashboards. I see by the clock on the wall, we're, we're running out of time. So rather than do demonstrations of those things, let me take some questions. Um, oh, but before I take some questions, uh, let me tell you how LPA can help in your uh, uh, Cognos 11 journey. Um, very straightforward, uh, um, you know, you're on a journey, you were maybe at eight, you've gone to 10, you want to go to 11, LPA can help you with that upgrade. We can help you on just with the planning of it. We can do the installation of it. Uh, we've had some clients have us do the upgrade of their development environment and teach them the upgrade path so they can do their production environment. Um, we can test your content. So after you've upgraded, you can prove that all your reports uh, still produce the same numbers. Uh, we can help you with support after you go live. Uh, lots of different ways that LPA can help you with uh, your upgrade. Um, and then after you've upgraded, you may need some training. You may need some report authoring training. Uh, you may need dashboard training, data module training. Uh, LPA offers classes in all of those things, all um, specific to Cognos 11. And many of them uh, we uh, modify to use your data. So they're really high impact uh, in terms of um, you know, people learning the tool with your data instead of sample data. Um, and we can deliver those uh, training services either on site or remotely. And now on to some questions. So the first question I have is when I upgrade from 1102 uh, to 1103, do I need to reinstall? Excellent question. So uh, up until uh, now, up through 1102, the advice I was giving folks based on my own experimentation was that you needed to um, upgrade by doing an uninstall, reinstall, just like when you upgraded from 10.2.0 to 10.2.1 to 10.2.2. That's not what IBM intended, but what I found is, you know, I have five or six environments at LPA, and when I went to do upgrades um, from 11.0 to 11.01 to 11.02, um, the overlay option, the install over the top, um, didn't work uh, on all of them. Uh, on simple ones that worked on more complex uh, uh, installations, it did not function. So I was advising people uninstall, reinstall was the way to go. With 11.03, uh, I'm happy to say that I was able to use the install over the top of my existing environment uh, on every one of my environments successfully. Uh, so I think that's very, very good news because with new releases coming out between 8 and 13 weeks, uh, uh, you know, bang, bang, bang through the year, um, being able to uh, overlay on top as opposed to do a full on, uh, a full install on a new server kind of approach with these, I think is going to be a big, big plus. So um, uh, the, uh, the 1103, I had great uh, success as an overlay. The next question, uh, when do I use the optional gateway? Um, it's probably a bigger question than we have time for. Uh, so I'll answer a little bit now and I'll follow up in an email. But the optional gateway, um, in a nutshell, you'd use it if you don't want the, the 9300 port in your URL. Um, you would use it if you're going to do single sign-on, let's say, with Active Directory. Uh, you would use it um, if you are going to, if you want to navigate to images using the Browse button when you add an image to uh, a report. Uh, you would use it... Um, to uh, um, uh, load balance across multiple gateways uh, for those of you who have an F5 switch. Um, there's a number of reasons that you might use it. There's no reason you must use it, but for the reasons I just listed, you, uh, you might find that you want to install it and configure it. Um, and the last question I have time for today is, uh, are packages available to source dashboards in this release? No, they are not. Um, you know, as I talk with the product management from time to time, it's absolutely on their radar to include uh, uh, packages as the source for dashboards. 
Uh, however, it's not part of the 1103 release. Um, you know, I have heard some unofficial discussion that um, they are working on it and they hope for it to be out this year. Uh, there should be two more releases this year. Uh, based on the cadence they're going, there should be an 1104 uh, and an 1105 release. So uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for that particular functionality to be. So right now in 1103, I can source a dashboard from a data module or an uploaded file and a combination of those. I cannot source a dashboard yet from a package. Certainly I can source reports from packages, both CQM and DQM packages, and from data modules, uh, but not yet dashboards. So hopefully that's um, something that's coming. Um, last thing about those kinds of enhancements, by the way, there is a website uh, that IBM hosts that you can submit enhancement requests on um, and have people vote on them. Um, if you have enhancements for 11, um, go out to this website. Um, you should be able to, to Google for it. Um, if not, uh, shoot me an email and I will send you the URL. But the notion is that you can create an enhancement um, and other people can vote on it. So go out and look at the ones that are there. Vote on the ones that you would like to have IBM implement. And if you don't find the one that you want, go ahead and enter it and then let people know about it so people can get on and vote for it. Well, I'm out of time again. Uh, thank you so much for attending today. Um, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much. For those of you who submitted questions that I didn't get to, I will answer those uh, as soon as I can by email. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar, uh, and I uh, hope to uh, virtually see you again uh, very, very soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.